Today we caught up with the woman who has been at the forefront of the evacuations, Her Excellency Assistant Foreign Minister Nuwal Khater. Thank you for talking to Thank us. Thank you so much, Qatar has been praised on a global scale for managing to carry out one of the largest um, airlifts of people in history. So how much were you taken by surprise? Well, I think all of us have been taken by uh, surprise, not only Qatar, but the entire world. Uh, the original quote-unquote timeline that was uh, given and announced to the world was uh, months. And then we woke up literally one morning um, with the need to evacuate thousands of people. Now, no one um, can say that they were ready for that an evacuation at that scale, at that level. Uh, what we had to do was to actually just react and act as soon and as quick as possible. And this is indeed what uh, we did. Um, we've done this, of course, with the uh, help of our international partners. And I should also praise many of the NGOs, Asmahan, here in Qatar. I mean, Qatar Charity is playing a role. Uh, the Qatar uh, Red Crescent is playing a role. Um, Qatar Foundation as well is actually having many programs here for the kids. As you can see, the kids are all around us. We didn't expect this number of kids, by the way, and number of, of women. Um, we're trying our best and uh, to make uh, things easier for um, our brothers and sisters who are evacuating Afghanistan. And uh, we will continue doing this uh, as long as it takes. But of course, carrying out the largest um, evacu one of the largest evacuations in history at a really fast rate has its own challenges. Absolutely. So can you tell us more about those challenges? No, absolutely. I mean, um, this process has been twofold. So there is the Qatar-led process and then the U.S.-led process. So the Qatar-led process is the process that was handled by Qatar from A to Z. That is receiving the requests, vetting them, checking the names, making sure that relatives are actually relatives uh, all the way through our embassy, you know, escorting the people and then our uh, Qatar Air Forces lifting them and then here us uh, receiving them and accommodating them. The other part of the process was uh, the US-led uh, evacuation and this was a different process and I should say this was um, happening at a larger scale. Our role as the state of Qatar and that was the following, providing the logistics. So uh, many of those uh, people, our brothers and sisters, have been transiting through Al Udaid Air Base. But they would spend sometimes a few days in Al Udaid Air Base, which is not necessarily equipped, as you can imagine. Um, and um, we had to uh, intervene in this process on humanitarian basis, even though the area itself is considered a free zone. Uh, that is not necessarily um, uh, the responsibility of the state of Qatar. Uh, yet, on a humanitarian basis, uh, we started building uh, many tents to accommodate uh, thousands of people. Uh, we started uh, distributing meals. I mean, Qatar um, uh, Defense, Ministry of Defense, is distributing around 50,000 meals per day. They're not necessarily uh, equipped uh, to do that, but we had to respond to the challenge. The Red Crescent has established uh, a field hospital there, uh, in addition to our Ministry of Health that dedicated one of the hospitals for the um, cases that need to be hospitalized. Um, so we're trying our best to uh, cope with that. Speaking of Al Adid Air Base, there have been concerns regarding the capacity uh, because the military post is only built to house only a certain number of people. So what are your thoughts about those concerns? Absolutely, those are legitimate concerns, I should say, and that's why we had to intervene immediately. In the pace of the uh, US-led evacuation uh, was just too fast, and we're trying to cope with that. As we speak currently, uh, Asmahan, uh, there are more and more uh, shelters being built just to accommodate uh, in addition to the more and more services being provided and uh, we are even receiving some uh, requests from uh, NGOs, international NGOs, uh, whether uh, help is needed. Uh, I would say that the situation is a temporary situation since most of the people are transiting. To uh, clarify uh, the picture, we talked about the 40,000 uh, people. Today we're talking about 43,000 people have been uh, 
uh, safely evacuated from Afghanistan. Almost 50% of that number actually, alhamdulillah, made it safely to their final destination. The remaining 50% were working with our international partners to also uh, basically secure a safe passage for them to their next destination and final destination. And while we do this, we try as much as possible to provide uh, for our brothers and sisters uh, their uh, main and, and basic needs. And honestly, for those um, who were uh, not able to cope with the conditions there, either due to age or uh, um, health condition, we actually evacuated them uh, to the uh, Qatar-led uh, dedicated accommodation, which is this accommodation on the other side, just to make sure that their well-being is preserved. So recently the Taliban said that they're going to stop people from going to the airport until after the 31st of August. So how did Qatar respond to that decision? If you want my honest assessment, Asmahan, from what we've seen, in the evacuation process. And this will not be the conventional answer that you will receive from an official, I should say. Um, much of the threat there in Afghanistan is becoming perceived rather than real. To give you an example, most of the threat is actually concentrated in the airport area because everyone is rushing to the airport area, right? So they become a, an easy target. Yet those who are staying at home hotels, whatever they are. I mean, there isn't a single valid report that suggests that anyone is breaking into homes or hotels. In other words, they're safer there than they are when they're trying to just uh, storm the, the airport. And this has been our honest advice to many of the NGOs and international organizations that wanted us to evacuate people yesterday and today just just quick fast you know we told them you know what if your people are staying where wherever they are safely then this is a better place for them once again just to summarize my point maybe it's better to wait a little bit assess the situation and look at what audience actually need, needs to be evacuated because the process as well needs to be vetted. And we need to understand whether those people need to actually leave Afghanistan or not. If we evacuate all doctors, all engineers, all people who can run the government institutions, then what's left for Afghanistan? And this is honestly our message to the world. We've been communicating this also to many of our international partners, telling them we understand and we've been playing a role in evacuating people like journalists, vocal activists, um, female students, because we know those might be a target. But the rest, if they're not active, if they're not you know, publicly known, and they're just doctors and, and engineers, maybe they need to reassess and we need to uh, reassess, the world needs to reassess uh, whether there's a real threat instead of this um, basically uh, ev evacuation that is draining Afghanistan from its brains as well, if, if, if you see my point. Those are our thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Once again, this is not the conventional answer that I should be uh, saying as an official, but this is the answer, the honest answer that I'm giving as a person who cares about the situation. So with the Taliban now being in power in Afghanistan, Many have halted aid to the country, including Germany. What is Qatar's response to such actions? So everyone currently is only focused on evacuation. But the next real threat to Afghanistan altogether would be an economic drop. And that's why our advice is to keep engaging constructively for the people of Afghanistan and not to cut off all help and aid. So our advice is let's think strategically, let's not react emotionally, and let's build on the pragmatism that Taliban has shown so far. They've been very pragmatic. Now, regardless of their intentions, what matters is their public actions. And as long as their public actions are in accordance to international standards, then I think we should act accordingly.
So once again, we don't want an economic recession drop happening in Afghanistan because this will be even worse that w than what we're seeing currently. So uh, now that presid former President Ashraf Ghani has left the country, there have, there have been clear shifts in the governance of Afghanistan overall. So is there anything left to negotiate in terms of the uh, Doha host the Doha facilitated peace process? Absolutely. Actually much to negotiate. The fact that uh, President uh, Ashraf Ghani left the country does not mean that the rest of the um, cabinet or the former government uh, are not there. As a matter of fact, all of them are there on the ground and uh, there have been uh, some meetings that took place and we still continue facilitating some discussions uh, amongst all parties. Now, so far, Taliban's promise was the following, is that they are willing to form a government that has a good representation of all Afghan factions. And this is what we're currently working on. The principle is there, and they agree to the principle, and the fact that people like Abdullah Abdullah and the rest are still there in Kabul, having those meetings, or even Hamd Karzai, uh, is uh, in its own uh, self-telling of the fact that there is a potential, there is a possibility of facilitating a discussion that would hopefully eventually would lead to an inclusive that's a very important term we're focusing on in our discussions with them, an inclusive government that would represent all Afghans. And as a matter of fact, we're trying to push for women representation as well. Now, whether this is going to happen or not, we should see, but this is at least what we're pushing for. So what's in it for Qatar diplomatically and domestically? That's a very good question. So one of the uh, our foreign policy pillars has been uh, preventive diplomacy. We believe that preventing a crisis before it uh, spreads is uh, going to protect us as a small state that is wedged between also big states in a very unstable uh, region. So there is definitely uh, an interest uh, in that. This is in addition to the fact that uh, in any mediation that we have been part of, we've been invited by the different parties. So we don't embark on any mediation uh, without being invited. And when we're invited, uh, I think it's very difficult to say no. What can the international community do to help with this crisis? It's basically to engage constructively, to shift from the evacuation mode into the aid and development mode, uh, to become more solution-oriented rather than uh, panicking and uh, being emergency-oriented. At the end of the day, uh, there are millions of people who are waiting for the international community to engage constructively. Let's remember Asmahan. This is a country that was not uh, living in, in, in heavens uh, before what happened. This is a country that had many, many challenges. and. Uh, the current situation just added to the complexity and that's why we need to think of those not only in Kabul and those provinces that no one is thinking about I mean you're, you're talking about medical needs you're talking about vaccination that is not taking place you're talking about uh, many being deprived from education by the way being deprived from education not necessarily due to ideological reasons Many of them, uh, I mean, just don't have access. They live in remote areas, etc. Uh, many of them don't realize uh, the need uh, for education. And I'm talking about education for both uh, genders. Uh, once again, engaging constructively, rationally, pragmatically would be the right move for the international community. Mm -hmm. And finally, for how long is Qatar going to continue evacuating people from Afghanistan? Well, as we're talking, the military side of the airport in Kabul, Hamid Karzai Airport, is ex expected to shut down. And this means that there will be no evacuation from that part of the airport. What we're working on is a wider plan, a political solution to resume the operations in the civilian side of the airport, which means that the inbound and outbound flights will just resume. And this way, those who need to leave can leave safely. 
I'm not sure at that point of time whether we're going to call it evacuation or not, but what I know for sure is that people who are in need to leave the country will receive all the aid that they need to do so. But those who don't need to, we shouldn't feed their insecurities, their fear, and make them, and push them actually, out of fear to evacuate their country. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Your Excellency.